Gone Home is a first-person narrative-based exploration game released in 2013 by the Fulbright Company. It was quickly lauded by many critics and is used as an example for the potential future of narrative in video games. A unique aspect of Gone Home's narrative and design is its refusal to use a damsel in distress trope to drive the player forward, something that is incredibly prevalent in mainstream game design. It does, however, engage with this trope to undermine it. Whereas other attempts at flipping the damsel in distress on its head are to empower the damsel to save itself, Fulbright never puts any of their characters in a state where they need to be saved. Each of them always has agency and control, and the ability to resist and subvert the different forms of oppression and violence they are faced with. One of the things that illustrates this from a design perspective is Katie Greenbrier, the player character. Our experience as Katie, essentially, is of investigator, of voyeur, and of curious older sister and daughter. But Katie is never placed in danger, never stumbles across some threat amongst the mystery of her family's whereabouts, and is thus never made a damsel. There are plenty of moments where Fulbright intentionally makes the player frightened and uneasy, but these are all designed to then highlight that there is nothing wrong. Likewise, Sam, the protagonist and narrator, is never a damsel. There are many instances where she tells Katie about the different kinds of conflicts she's forced into and engages with, but Fulbright has intentionally set her up in situations where she has some way to fight back, to find herself, and to subvert the oppression she's faced with. It's different now. I mean, we still hang out all the time like before. But now when no one else is around... Well, you know... So you could say we're dating. But it's secret. The main conflict presented in Gone Home is one of woman versus society. Most of the violence and oppression that Sam faces is at a societal level, but she quickly gains allies that help her in the struggle. She becomes friends with Lonnie, initially just a girl Sam thinks is cool, and is introduced to the Riot Girl subculture. As they get closer, they discover themselves in this movement and form a clique with friends that they feel safe around. They have their own scene, their own band, they find idols in this subculture. Even when Sam is bullied and her locker defaced, one of the most violent acts against her, this is followed up with Lonnie retaliating in defense of Sam. This is not, however, a way to characterize Sam as someone who needs to be defended. This is more a moment that reveals Lonnie's impulsiveness and staunch opposition to the kind of oppression they face as lesbians. However, when Lonnie is punished for defacing her own locker, Sam writes a letter to the principal defending Lonnie. In the same way that Lonnie defends Sam against the bullies at their school, Sam defends Lonnie against the institution that refuses to acknowledge them as victims and only seeks to label them as the problem. The struggles Sam faces with her parents are in many ways in the teenage experience vernacular. Being told not to close her bedroom door, restricting sleepovers, and time spent with her partner are all things that teenagers can experience regardless of gender and sexuality. This creates a relatable experience for the player and builds a bridge between the player and its characters rather than othering them. Moreover, this is something that Sam immediately begins plotting how to subvert. She plans how she can sneak private time with Lonnie, she demonstrates a willingness to deceive her parents, and essentially doesn't take a no for an answer. She does not even attend her own scolding at one point, forcing her parents to leave her an angry note instead. This reveals that though the parents fill the role of antagonist at certain points, they are never portrayed as villains. Throughout Gone Home, they are nuanced and developed in almost as much detail as Sam, the main difference being that they have no audio diaries. If the player chooses to disable Sam's audio diaries, an option Fulbright includes, they will find there's little narrative hierarchy between the mother, father, and Sam's struggles. We understand the parents, their individual struggles, and their struggle of a difficult marriage, and their place in a society that doesn't accept other or alternate gender identities. I do not wish to trivialize how harmful or oppressive or violent their actions are towards Sam and Lonnie. Instead, I want to highlight how developed they are as sympathetic and empathetic characters, and how the three of them are essentially people who are acting out of fear and love. The parents may play the role of antagonist for a short stretch of this game, but they are not villains. And as they are not villains, they do not have the power to make Sam and Lonnie damsels. 
In the same way that Sam subverted and resisted her parents' punishment by refusing to attend her scolding, her parents chose not to force her to sit and be scolded. Despite their anger, they gave her the ability to find her own space. This also plays into design decisions that Fulbright reveals in their developer commentary. In previous drafts of the story, Lonnie's father walks in on them and threatens to send Lonnie to live with her mother in Florida. This is something that was discarded specifically because it was too great of an external force that Lonnie or Sam could do nothing about. Sam and Lonnie do not simply happen to always have some agency and power. It is not a coincidence that they are not damsels. It is by Fulbright's design. And seeing the kind of narrative editing decisions that were made highlights the things that made it into the final cut. Every scenario is one where Sam and Lonnie have power. Lonnie, Sam's best friend and eventually girlfriend, is quite similar to Sam in the kind of character arcs and struggles they face. Sam is in a process of self-discovery, of coming out, and of realizing the kind of struggles she is going to face as a lesbian. Lonnie is hot-tempered, she's confident, and she knows who she is and what she wants to be. While Lonnie isn't in many ways a more confident person than Sam, their self-discovery cannot be completed without each other. Lonnie brought her hair dye over today. She said, I need to fix these roots, think you could help? Dying hair is weirdly intimate. I don't know if I've touched someone else's scalp before. That's pretty intimate, right? It felt intimate. At the beginning of the game, we find a voicemail of a girl crying for Sam, increasingly desperate. Sam, where are you? Really? to talk to you. Please be there. This is one of the earliest hints that something has gone wrong. This is revealed at the end to be the climax of our story. Lonnie, having left to join the military, realizes she can't leave Sam. One of the biggest indicators that Sam was in danger or that something has gone wrong turns out to be the opposite. The culmination of Lonnie's arcs is a decision to abandon her dream of following in her father's footsteps and joining the army. And we assumed, by Fulbright's design, that the voicemail was a cry of fear. In actuality, it was a cry for love. And this is not a decision Lonnie makes at her own expense for Sam. This is a reevaluation of her priorities and discovering that being with Sam is most important to her. Likewise, Sam did not lose herself in this scenario. She comes to terms with the fact that Lonnie, though the most positive force in her life, also happens to be the person that she has the least control over. She comes to terms with the fact that Lonnie is leaving and that she will have to move on. While the game ultimately has a happy ending for all the characters, it does not paint a scenario where Sam and Lonnie could not survive without each other. The strength and support they gain from each other is also based upon their independence as strong people. To return to the note at the beginning of the game, we can reevaluate Sam's intentions while writing it. It is obvious that Fulbright uses this note to drive the player forward through anxiety and through fear for Sam. Rereading it after knowing how Sam and Lonnie's stories end, it becomes the complete opposite. Instead of a note written in desperation, it is Sam's declaration that she is taking control of her life and that she and Lonnie are not running away from a society that rejects them, but instead are running towards and creating somewhere that will accept them. Essentially, they choose to carve a safe place for each other and for themselves. And ultimately, this is all they ever did. They rejected the society that so quickly rejected and denied them their essential selves and identities. They were never damsels, lost in need of rescuing. They do not even rescue each other. But they move forward together, saying goodbye to a reunion with Katie and to the army, and saying yes to a future together. <laughs>